Hello and uh, welcome uh, to everyone. Uh, this is episode 82 of the COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, this is a really special episode. Um, this is a, a takeover episode being led by the Royal College of Surgeons. Today we'll be talking about post-pandemic staff recovery. As everyone's aware, there's plenty to discuss. And as usual, uh, I would ask that you join in by uh, entering questions into the QA box, and we will try to answer these as best as we can. My name is Stella Vig. I'm a consultant vascular general um, and uh, general surgeon based at Croydon, uh, but also um, a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England Council. I'm delighted today to be joined by two of my colleagues, um, and I will introduce you to Greta first, if I may. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this. My name is Greta McLachlan. I'm a general surgical hire trainee based in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. Um, and I'm also a leadership fellow at Cleveland Clinic London and a co-founder of Women Speakers in Healthcare. Greta, thank you so much. And may I also introduce Peter? Hello, thanks very much indeed, Stella. And uh, uh, what an honour um, honor it is to be here. Um, my name is Peter Brennan. I'm a maxillofacial surgeon based on the south coast in Portsmouth. Uh, I'm an elected member of the RCS Council, like Stella. Uh, have a particular interest in team working, human factors, um, with a PhD or recent PhD. And I've published uh, widely in this, in this area, particularly around team working. Thank you. Peter, Gressa, thank you so much. So if I may start just with where we all are. So I don't think any of us could imagine, especially as surgeons that, you know, back last March that we would be going into Easter having absolutely no elective surgery. Um, it's unfathomable and uh, the uh, strain and stress on our staff um, and in particular with our patients has been uh, it, it's unheralded, her, unheralded um, and uh, very, very difficult to manage. So we're now sitting with 5.3 million people sitting on our waiting list, waiting treatment. We've got patients with lives on hold um, because they're not getting the care they rightly deserve. Um, and of course, with uh, the country opening up on the 19th, we don't know what we are going to face in terms of winter pressures this year. So I'd like to reflect back on... Um, where we have all been, what it's felt like, what has happened uh, since April last year. So, so Greta, may I come to you first? Your reflections on the last 15 months or so. Thanks, Stella. I think it's from a, and I'll be speaking obviously from a, a trainee point of view, but I think it's, as we know from a surgical perspective, trainee numbers have been down by about 50% which obviously has got quite a large impact on our training because the way that we assess and, and, and make sure that trainees are well-trained and have enough experience to become consultants is we look at numbers, we look at work-based assessments. Um, and I think whilst work-based assessments themselves are holding steady, the numbers of elective procedures, the number of emergency procedures are down on the whole, and that's across the board, whatever surgical specialty you're in. That means that in terms of progressing forward, is there a question about whether CCTs are being put off? And I think the anecdotal evidence is, yes, things are being put off a bit, which puts slightly more strain on consultant numbers and, and filling those gaps that are available um, that are coming up from retiring consultants or people leaving medicine. So that's an extra strain on the system. But I think from a surgical trainee's point of view as well, and I'm, I may get slack for this, but um, I think perhaps it's not been as bad being a surgical trainee as it has in other specialties. Our job is to operate. Um, we've had less elective numbers coming in. So we've had less work, inverted commas, to do. So actually, whilst we have been redeployed to a certain extent as registrars, it's not been as um, full on, I think, as you, as you have as perhaps an SHO or an F1 or as an F2. So actually, I think from the, the team point of view, surgeons are almost much more eager and keen to be getting back to work, perhaps because we've not had as much 
stress as some of our counterparts. Like I say, that might be a slightly controversial thing to say. Um, I'll hand over to Peter at that point, now that I've put my foot in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, I mean, I think, I think for me, the, the, you know, the start of it, um, absolute terror, Stella, you know, going into theatre, uh, wearing the PPE, not, not really knowing what this virus was, what we're dealing with. Um, and of course, uh, I operate on the upper on the upper airway. And of course, you'll you'll be aware that uh, several um, colleagues actually died of, um, of it. Uh, um, in, a, in an early stage and um, you know that that sent shock waves uh, round. Um, so you know just that just that fear fear if you like and then of course um, all of the other knock-on effects uh, wearing the PPE the effective the effective communication which you know 90% of uh, of communication is non-verbal so so have, having a mask on and not not being able to read what the what the team were thinking um, you know different members of the team going out I mean I look at our, our anaesthetic colleagues, our ICU colleagues having to work, you know, just uh, crazy, crazy hours. Uh, juniors being redeployed um, in roles that they hadn't, they hadn't done. Uh, we, we were lucky actually in that uh, we had a couple of weeks when there was no surgery at all. Uh, most of my operating is oncology based so that that actually proceeded uh, albeit perhaps not um, you know with sort of compromises in uh, uh, you know in free flaps for example in microvascular 12 14 hour operations and we would do other procedures uh, to reconstruct but um, I think I think it's you know as you said unheralded I think I think that's the word and uh, it's it's you know we've never been in this situation before um, hopefully we were we were coming out of it and now you know numbers are rising we're entering a third wave where's the future going to be what's going to happen it's just all this all this uncertainty Stella which which obviously plays on all of us you know in primary care in secondary care nurses the whole the whole team I mean I know I know we're taking this meeting over as surgeons but this is for all of us you know thank you thank you very much and, and I think if we just an expand on, I'm just going to reflect on something, but Greta, just ask you to consider um, your thoughts around F1s and core trainees in surgery, how they're affected. It would be really helpful to hear from you on that. And, and Peter, in terms of that expanded surgical team in your hospital, the surgical team that you would normally have worked with every day, where were those teams uh, uh redeployed to so I'll come back to both of you if I may in a moment but just my own reflection on on that time was um absolutely recognize what you all say and, and in our trust certainly the the junior doctors were redeployed everywhere we almost lost all junior doctors apart from our registrars um and uh, and and I think what I found incredible was uh, any time we asked anyone for help and asked people to move of course people were scared and people were anxious but actually people just gone on with it and the second thing that I found was absolutely incredible, wonderful, and it's just such a pity that we've needed a disaster to, to do this in a pandemic, is the new ways of working that have been implemented amongst all our teams, whether it's e-consultations or virtual phone calls or even changing the way we manage appendicitis or pancreatitis and ambulatory pathways, all those things that have come from, you know, our teams on the shop floor um our orthopedic consultants you know completely changed their orthopedic pathways they've been incredible the clinical prioritization so much work has been done in such a short space of time that i have to say i've been humbled by my colleagues by, by what's been achieved but the patients for me are the biggest story the patients are really anxious they're anxious about coming to hospital um and even someone who you know we provide the safest environment we can patients are really really uncomfortable about coming to the acute sector for care and and also so in the conversation is how do we encourage our patients to have the the treatment they need to get on with their lives so I'm going to stop then if I may go back Greta in terms of the patient conversation but also on on more junior surgical colleagues and Peter if I may about the surgical team so Greta back to you first well, it's a really interesting question. And actually, so I was working at NHS England during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, I was very lucky to work with some very experienced um, army officials. Um, and we were talking about the workforce and, and how you cope with things. Um, and actually, they said that the army has done quite a lot of research into 
um, post-traumatic stress disorder, understandably mental health issues. And they said the thing that they have found is that if you tell your average squaddy or officer that they're going to go to war for six months, you can effectively throw almost anything at them and ask them to do almost anything because they know there is an end in sight. They know they're only doing it for six months. If you say you're going for an indefinite amount of time, then the uh, workforce attitude and actually the repercussions after that are much, much higher because you don't have this end point. You don't have this time of coming out. And I think that's where we're at with this pandemic is when it first started, we thought maybe six months, maybe a year. We're now 80 months down the line. We're looking at a third wave, which may or may not be worse than the first or second. We'll leave that to uh, far, far more informed people and ourselves to decide on that. But I think that's something that has been a real struggle. And I know that in the hospital that I was working at, the F1s and F2s were redeployed and we said, we'll give you, we'll look at this on a sort of three month basis. So I think we went December, we redeployed properly middle of December, January, February. And then I think we just about came off it just before March. Now, the good thing about that was that we gave everyone a time period, but we also did say this may change. And I must say that the F1s and the SHOs that were redeployed, like you said, Stella, were absolutely fantastic. Um, we had to make sure that our rotor was in keeping with the BMA, uh, which meant a lot of chopping and changing, which was really tricky as a registrar and a consultant, because each day you might have a different person looking after the patient. So you really needed to make sure that you knew the patient numbers. But again, patient numbers were less. So that's uh, maybe a, a blessing in disguise. Um, but I think talking to the F1s and the F2s, there was a real feeling of camaraderie. There was a real feeling of we're in this together. I think there was a lot more perhaps pastoral care from the consultants and registrars than perhaps maybe there normally is. Um, and there was a real feeling of we are in this together and we can do this together. And also just a real, ex a, a real understanding that it is really rubbish. And that actually there isn't a huge amount that we can do and we're trying to do the best. And I think that was very much felt across the, the managerial and leadership side of things as well. And very much trying to give people annual leave when we could, particularly from the manager's point of view, trying to give time off where we could and just really trying to respect the fact that this is really blooming difficult, but that hopefully it will come to an end at some point. Um, yeah, I think it, it's been tricky, but there are positives to it. Thank you very much, Greta. And Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, team team working is really, really important, obviously. And, you know, for me, it's 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 just emphasising all the stuff that, I, that I've done over the last few years about valuing everyone in that team from, you know, um, whoever it is, a medical student that comes in right the way through to, to the chief executive, valuing everyone, lowering those authority gradients, that was really, really important. Um, and, you know, work, working with people, Stella, that you haven't worked with before, you know, the saddest thing for me was, you know, some of our trainees were deployed to respiratory wards to do, you know, to help out. And we were going ahead and do, doing the surgery and they and they weren't getting that that surgical experience and that really upset me actually because I feel you know every operation we do should should be a learning or a training opportunity um, and I think uh, you know as you say so so many good things though have come out of this and you know we're looking at prioritization you know as you mentioned Stella and in fact Dr Addy had a um, had a, a question on the on the chat about um, retired surgeons coming out and and actually helping things and that that is something that that I can tell you that the Royal College of Surgeons is is actively considering and and actually promoting. I think with sort of prioritisation. So so there's going to be three three levels of prioritisation. One from um, uh, you know administration staff. Um, next coming down to almost like a pre-assessment type uh, clinic with nurses phoning patients, um, and then maybe surgeons, retired surgeons, and others actively getting involved and prioritising and actually working out where where those patients are coming. So. Um, you know, uh, uh, looking at all the negatives, so so many really positive uh, th things have come, and I guess I guess my own 
work on um, on human factors. We've you know we've done masses of of extra work. In fact, I've been busier than I than I ever have, and we published probably twenty or thirty papers in the last year about effective team working, better communication, working with PPE, the perils, uh, virtual platforms, getting the best out of virtual consultations, virtual exams, and things which are now are now going. So um, yeah, I'm just. Um, I suppose I'm an optimist rather than a pessimist, but um, I'm looking at the positive things that have come out of it. Peter, thank you. And, and, I, and, I, and I think just just don't want to miss the opportunity of saying thank you to every single member of the NHS that has supported. Um, and I say that I think we've we've um, understood even more the value of that extended surgical team that we work for with you know the HCAs, porters, you know, clean there is such a mass of individuals uh, in the NHS that supports the patient having a, a safe and effective operation. If I may, I just want to move on to um uh, so Carol Gray's asked a question in the group in the chat um in terms of what new ways of working are we going to keep? Um, and also Greta to your point of now that we there's a very good um, piece of evidence that shows a year after an impact of a disaster, people go to an all time low. And we've sort of been in that period since sort of April onwards. Um, what would be your recommendations now for recoup and recovery for mentally and physically exhausted staff, not the extended surgical team, not just surgeons? What would be your advice to them now over the next couple of months? And also from each of you, what two things are you going to hope to keep once this pandemic's over? New ways of working. Greta, you go first. Ladies first, always. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll take that as a lady. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I was reading about this and, and the numbers are, for want of a better word, quite saddening. Um, we're looking at 45% of doctors and healthcare staff suffering some kind of PTSD, some kind of depression, some kind of anxiety. Now they aren't extreme or severe problems, but that is much higher than the general population which sits at about 4%. And for combat staff, combat veterans, it sits at about 17%. So, and those numbers seem to be fairly um, consistent no matter which, which uh, papers you're looking at. And I'm happy to share those. Um, references later on if, if people want. I think one of the most important things for us to remember and to us for us to do that you can do individually is to just destigmatize mental health problems. You know, that's one in two of us effectively. So that means if you look at, you know, the, the three of us here, there's one of us that might be suffering from that. Um, I, I'll happily hold up my hand and say, maybe not PTSD, but I definitely feel like my, my morale is low um, and definitely suffering with that. Um, just, this is long, isn't it? We're, we're struggling, it's tough. Um, so I think that destigmatization is incredibly important so that people can talk about this, so people can put up their hands and say, actually, I'm struggling at the minute or I'm, I'm not feeling as good as I used to. Being able to talk about it with somebody else and say, oh, I'm feeling that way, too. And actually, isn't this isn't this rubbish? Isn't this crap? I think we then need to be making sure that those people that are suffering have got access to good mental health support. And I've been trying to rack my brains. I cannot remember which London Hospital Trust it is, but I know that one of them have actually brought in um, army psychiatrists and psychologists who are talking through and are available there to debrief team members, particularly the critical care staff, which includes pretty much everyone now, I think, because everyone has worked in, in critical care and ITU, to be able to discuss and have that debrief, that sort of externalization of what are the issues, because we deal much better with issues once they're outside our head that's why therapy and things are quite good because you can externalize write it down you make those thoughts something else and I think that's something perhaps in medicine we aren't necessarily as as good at particularly as surgeons we like to bottle things up so I think that that experience of just being able to externalize those emotions I think is an incredibly powerful thing something that we can all fundamentally do together Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Um, and the Royal College of Surgeons certainly has a, a very good counselling service offer and, and surgeons in particular are very bad, Greta, at saying, I need help. And I think there is something about all of us. And, and I know that I agree with you, even I'm exhausted. Um, and I, I think, you know, asking each other, are you OK? 
uh, and asking ourselves, are we okay? And of course, not forgetting our, our families who are also um, struggling at the minute. Uh, this, is a, this is a team effort, as I keep saying. Peter, may I go across to yourself? Yeah, it's always, um, it's, a, it's a little bit like uh, being in a course and you, you go around the room and then I, you know, I'm the last person and everyone said what I was going to say. Um, I, uh, yeah, just, I'm um, just accepting, you know, we're, we're human. We, we have emotions, we have fears, we have all those things and actually accepting. And I think all of us, you know, we, we are tired. You, you just have to look at the figures, you know, Greta's already, already mentioned that you've got people retiring early because, because they've had enough, they're leaving. Um, you know, that, that obviously creates more issues potentially for that, for those staying, um, staying behind. But, but of course we respect, we respect each other. Um, I think uh, making sure that you, that you do look after yourself and that's you know something we we actively promote and actually taking the time i've got i've got gp friends saying that they're working till 10 11 o'clock at night uh, uh you know you have to take time to look after yourself you have to stop and actually build in a weekend off or a few days off here and there um so i'm supposed to be in a virtual uh, sorry i'm supposed to be in a uh, in a conference this week in Paris, uh, conference is still going ahead. It's virtual. I would have, I would have loved to have gone to Paris. I'm giving a, a, a keynote talk tomorrow virtually. Um, I think that's something that's that's a very positive thing. You know, saving the saving the planet with traveling and what have you. But nonetheless, I've actually set up my out of office and I'm not dealing with my emails. I get 100, 150 emails a day and I've actually set my out of office and said, I'm actually away. Uh, you know, if it needs my own attention, resend it when I get back. So you're, you're actually creating space for yourself, for your family, for your, for your teammates. Really, really important. Absolutely critical. Thank you, Peter. And, and I think, and hopefully you'll agree that I think advice now we've got some sunshine. Yes, we've had lots of rain, but we've got some sunshine now um, is really, I think, August, July and August, these next six weeks need to be really take a holiday, take a break, stop because it's really, really important that people have some time out and people have carried over leave from last year and are still struggling to know whether they can go on holiday. Staycation in this country is still, you need to be just out of work uh, and have time with family um, and enjoy uh, friendships. Um, the one thing I, I, so I'm just gonna go back to Peter, what you said, which is uh, I love the conversation of virtual. I, I tend to get so much more done without having to travel into London and back all the time. Um, yeah. And a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so one is uh, from Itali Das. Um, Itali, lovely to hear from you. Uh, HSJ have published an article stating that trust can only get funding uh, from the recovery fund if operating at 95% of capacity. That's what's called the elective recovery fund. So from Roger Kirby um, saying 50, 520,000 people were pinged in the NHS in a single um, week recently. Will current 10 day self-isolation rules make making the backlog even more difficult? So I'm gonna start that conversation and I, and I do want to talk about recovery. Um, so, 5.3 million people waiting. Um, absolutely, if we continue to do normal for the NHS, which wasn't excellent when we went into, you know, pre-COVID. Um, if we continue, if we go back to normal, we will not be anywhere near ensuring that patients get treatment in the right time frame until 2025, at least. We also know that there are up to 10 million people waiting who have not access care for lots of anxiety reasons because frankly, they need to earn the money and they haven't had time to go to the general practitioner to ask for advice and they're coming in later. So we don't quite know what's going to happen with the waiting list. And there is an estimate that actually that waiting list is going to achieve at 10 million really within the next six months. So the, the conversation that I'm absolutely hanging on to and, and trying to implement is that conversation of working smarter, not harder. So doing more with what we have. So utilizing our, our theater lists well. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that working smarter, not harder conversation. What can we do to help ourselves to deliver that? The second thing is just going back to Roger's question, um, the 10 day self isolation, we're finding that difficult already in our trust that people are taking time off. And I know there is guidance coming in that suggests that uh, being pinged by an app, there will be an exclusion for healthcare workers. So Roger, I think the answer to that one is yes, it will make it difficult with what we have, 
but we think there is something coming in that will help support that conversation. But if I could take you to, um, uh, to um, Peter, may I go to you first? In yep. terms of elected backwards, working smarter, not yep. harder. Yeah, um, well, I really like that term. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've done quite a bit of work around um, efficiency and things. And I'm sure in most, in most trusts, you know, the amount of time that's lost or wasted through, through waiting for patients to come, but, you know, they're sent for, you wait an hour for them to come round. Um, you know, there is, there is so much inefficiency uh, in the, in the health service. And you look at the actual operating time is, um, is maybe an hour, but it, but it might take three hours with all with all the turnaround and all the other things. So I think so I think better better team working is um, absolutely vital, and actually better integration uh, with the organisation, with the managers, with the with the people, um, the administrators, and things to to actually facilitate uh, and get things through. And I think you know um, you don't necessarily have to work harder, Stella. No, I don't think you do. You need to be more efficient. You need to be smarter, just as you've said. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I think Miriam Day has written in the group, um, waiting lists were bad before in Wales. Um, and as clinicians, saying that clinicians feel powerless to do anything differently. Greta, what would be your thoughts on what we can do to do uh, to ensure that we work smarter, not harder? And just your conversation with Miriam, we feel powerless. How can we support people doing things differently? I, th I think this is a really um, a common uh, thread that uh, I hear consultants say and, and trainees say qu quite a lot um, and actually something that comes up in the um, Association of Anaesthetists um, recent review on their trainees is just this feeling of hopelessness and sort of out, out of control. You know, we are in a pandemic and we can't control that. I think something that is really important that we actually aren't necessarily that good at doing as clinicians is actually working with management um, and really trying to, to blend that leadership model that we have. Um, yes, it can be tricky. Yes, it can be frustrating. But actually, if we work with managers and we work with the leadership within the hospital, you can A, understand why things are done in certain ways. Um, like we say, when, when there's, like Mitali mentioned, you know, we have to work at 95% to be able to get this money. Okay, well, if we need to get the money to fund it, then in what way can we work at 95% or is there a way around that? You know, we, we know that if we have green hubs, the elective recovery pathway, then we get the money from the government, we get the 1 billion that they're talking about. So I think having an open and honest conversation at directorate level um, with your clinical directors, with your um, directorates with your medical directors with the chief exec you know speak to these people who have quote unquote the power so that you can work out what you can do to be part of that conversation um, because you know we're feeling exhausted they are too actually let's work together on this let's work as a team across not just specialties but across that you know me versus them managers and and clinicians it, it it's never going to be easy but you see that we have fundamentally we all want the same thing we want good patient care and we want good patient safety and actually if you put that as your forefront for everything then you can really achieve quite a lot we set up a, a junior doctors um sort of comms uh with the managers and, and with the junior doctors and that worked really well during covid because we felt like we knew what was happening we knew what the daily numbers were we knew when stuff was being reopened when it was being shut and whilst we may not have had that much control over it, it just felt like you were in part of the process and that you weren't being forgotten by management, which I think, unfortunately, sometimes can be a feeling, rightly or wrongly, um, from clinical staff. And I think, Greta, my, my reflection on um, the last 18 months is in organisations where, whether it was there or not before COVID, where through COVID, as you say, operational managers and clinical clinicians have stood up spoken up and the clinical voice has been heard they're the ones that are innovating and making a difference and Miriam my, my conversation back to you is that there is um so the the college the Royal College of Surgeons have discussed a, a new deal for surgery and the new deal for surgery really has three legs uh, one is there needs to be enough funding uh, to do what we need to do so we can't have a billion pounds of funding one year and then be told there's nothing coming through we need to know it's there for five years and we use that uh, innovative, innovatively to do what we need to do 
The second is we need beds um, because without beds, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and those areas that are separated into surgical hubs and separated green pathways, um, emergency and elective pathways, and actually ring fence them, actually in those areas, the um, patients are getting better care because they're getting more timely care and the patient is important. Um, but of course, where you can't separate, beds are going to be important. And this year, it's not going to be winter pressures, which we're in already. It's going to be flu pressures. It's going to be norovirus. It's going to be everything else that hits us coming through as well. So the third bit of the New Deal for surgery is really important, which is uh, resource, which is the people that work in it. So a couple of people, and forgive me if I don't get uh, names because I'm, I'm having to curse up and down a little bit on this. Um, so um, people who have... Um, come back uh, to the NHS um, under the emergency COVID conversation with the GMC. Um, people are being um, deployed as medical support workers uh, within the NHS. Nick Wilcox, I think you said, what can the NHS do about uh, the, the really poor staff retention? I think that now is really understood and actually is being addressed. So medical support workers, um, people who've come back from retirement or uh, who needed to take time out who are now beginning to come back. How do we uh, ensure that they're in the right place? Um, so Katie, uh, that was your question about emergency practitioners list. Um, they are being pulled in uh, to supporters and they've been absolutely incredible. Um, the um, retired surgeons uh, help with waiting lists, that's Kalpana Patel, uh, several retired surgeons, absolutely happy to help with waiting lists, but actually they're phenomenal in terms of educational roles. So actually, you know, give, give someone a parallel list, we talk about a, a shop floor trainer, give someone a, a, a significant role in training, a surgical training on the shop floor. Uh, and that's a lovely job for someone who's coming out of retirement, a nice sensible list to train someone and actually get a reward from training um, and actually being valued for what you do. So absolutely space for all this to come. But I think this is now an important conversation that is going to be based on finance. We need to have the money to do what we need to do. Um, so in terms of um, just elective recovery, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of questions that are coming in. Um, and please, um, Peter and Greta, if you see a question that you'd like to answer, tell me if I don't pick up the one that you want. So Adam's asked about uh, staff burnout. Absolutely cognizant yeah. that there is staff burnout. Um, the, um, I'm just going to go back to a question that Shola has asked, because I think it's really important and worth going back to. Shola Dadra said, admitting struggling at work is still yeah, seen that. as being weak, especially with the increased demand. Tell me your thoughts, both of you, on that, because I think that's such a pertinent question. Yeah, I saw, um, I saw that and uh, uh, wanted to pick up on that. Um, I mean, basically, we need a culture change across the whole NHS. Uh, period you know there is uh, a document that you may have seen or actually probably haven't seen it's called opening the door to change it was published by the CQC uh, in 2018 um, just before Christmas 2018 and it basically talks about staff well-being talks about human factors talks about just culture um, and when you ask people and then it says at the bottom this should be read by every member of the NHS uh, regardless of grade or position when you ask people have you seen this document no one's actually seen it um, so you know we need a culture change we People need to accept that, you know, as I said, as I said earlier, that we are uh, human and and we are vulnerable. And of course, the the longer this goes on, we're we're tired, we're getting burnout, we're getting all those things. And it shouldn't be a weakness to actually admit to it. it should be a strength that that we can, you know, as Greta said, we can actually get that out into the open uh, and build in uh, time away. Um, you know, rest periods and all, and all the other things. So um, it actually needs a culture change, most definitely. And I mean, for me, you know, I, um, I talk about tiredness quite a lot and things as well. So, you know, if you've, if you've been up all night uh, on call and then you've got a busy operating list or a busy clinic or whatever it is, um, I now call that and I will go to the managers and say, uh, I don't feel safe to operate. Um, uh, and then they say, well, you have a busy list. You've got a busy clinic. It's like no one knows how you you feel and if you don't feel if you're tired or you haven't had any sleep and you don't feel able to you know we should then be able to uh, call that and say sorry we're not we're not going to continue Greta yeah it's um 
Look, I think before the pandemic, we had an alternative pandemic in healthcare, which was burnout. If you look at all the stats from burnout prior to the pandemic, we were still at 50%. Now, quite a lot of that is American based, but actually in the UK, again, the numbers are roughly the same. And it, it, it's, it's on a variable scale. So yes, some people have got severe burnout, some people haven't. The fundamental thing that we need to do is we need to change the culture. It's not just about individual resilience and that gets every trainee's back up when you say you need to be more resilient because we're pretty blooming resilient already. We wouldn't be if we weren't. We, we have to be to be in medicine to get to the point where we've got to, we've got to be resilient. The resilience needs to come from the system. And like you say, Peter, from the managers who will go, right, if you're not safe, I will support you on that and I will cancel the list for the day and we have to work it out another time. Yes, it, it puts back the waiting list, but actually the staff are fundamentally the most important part of healthcare, obviously barring the patients, because without them, we don't have a, a healthcare system. And it really, it, it, it's culture, it's culture, it's culture. A friend of mine, I, I love this quote, he says that um, training and medicine are, are hard, but they shouldn't be difficult. And I think that's what we're trying to change at the minute. We can't make the job less hard because actually that's part and parcel of it and I think that's part of the challenge that we've we've gone into medicine because we enjoy that that hardness of it but it shouldn't be difficult and we should be trying to make it as accessible and as friendly and as accommodating as possible and it it, it fundamentally comes down to culture what we are prepared to accept and what we are not prepared to accept in regards to being seen as weak or uh, just supporting each other's mental health. So just, just to in, underpin that conversation, I would like each and every one of us who's on this call today to ask people tomorrow, are you okay? And actually listen to the response. Give space and time to listen to the response. If you see someone behaving in a slightly different way, ask them if we're okay. And as Greta says, this is not just a COVID conversation. People are getting divorced finding they haven't got enough money, child you know, problems, elderly relatives who uh, are feeling um, really uncomfortable. The support that is being given by each individual to a bigger personal network is phenomenal. So burnout is not just COVID related, it's bigger than that. And, and we have been very poor in, in the healthcare industry to ask each other whether we're okay. And the, the mechanisms now to support are, are phenomenal in every trust, in every organization, at ICS levels, through the colleges. Um, Jane has put a link in into the group for the, for the college support system. Uh, Health Education England, if you're a trainee, there is so much support out there. We really just need to find people who need to be encouraged to go and actually say it's not a stigma to ask for help. I've it's asked just... for help. I've asked for help. I would encourage everyone else to ask for help. There is no one sitting among us, amongst us who has not needed help. It's recognising it, maybe either in yourself or or a colleague, rec recognising what those subtle signs are of impending burnout. So, you know, you're sleeping, but you wake up in the morning tired. You know, you, you're you making careless mistakes. You're, re you're ringing the wrong people. You're dictating on the wrong patient. Um, you know, you're you're short with people. You're, you know, your personality changes. You you were a nice bubbly person and you start being a little bit short. You know, there's, there's lots of subtle signs. And if you recognize that in yourself, or a friend or a colleague or teammate, um, as Stella says, are, are you okay? And be prepared to actively listen rather than are you okay? Yep, uh, carry on. You know, that active listening is a really important skill that we, we need as well. So in the last five to 10 minutes, then I can't emphasize how important that conversation we've just had is, and I hope that's a take home message for everyone. But in the last um, five to 10 minutes, if I can have a little bit of indulgence at the end, what I'd like to know from both of you is what would you say to a patient who is sitting on a waiting list at the minute or waiting for health care? What would you say to them to ensure they get the right treatment that they deserve? And also, what would you say to colleagues at work to support them in terms of our recovery phase? And Greta, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I'd love you to talk also in terms of educational recovery. So for me, elective recovery, managing patients has to come with making sure our trainees get trained as well. So for you and added bits, I'm gonna ask you to go second so you've got time to think. Oh. Education and elective recovery. So Peter, over to you first. Uh, uh, right, that's it. Now you put you put me on the spot now. Um, okay, we're, we're all here for 
uh, our patients, aren't we? So, um, you know, that's uh, that's why we do medicine. That's why we're involved in healthcare. Um, so the first thing I say to that, I actually apologize and say, look, I'm really, really sorry that you're that you're waiting, you're in pain, you know, and, and um, a personal apology, e even though it's not my particular fault necessarily, but, you know, that that goes a long way. Um, and I guess, you know, some, some of the work that Scarlett McNally and, uh, and, Tim, and Tim Goodacre have done around kind of optimizing uh, patients' health as best as they can whilst waiting for, um, for surgery. So, you know, doing some exercise if they can and, you know, they're able to and they haven't got severe osteoarthritis, perhaps waiting for a, for a knee replacement. Um, considering um, stopping smoking, for example, considering look at, looking at alcohol intake and you know, people people during the pandemic have been have been drinking perhaps more. Um, well, now's the time to consider. Look, look, could you could you reduce? So, all, so all of those things. Um, I think in terms of colleagues, it's uh, as we said at the beginning, we're in this together. Um, uh, you know, there's no I in team, and I and I say that time and time and time again. You know, we we are one team. We're all equals, uh, uh, and that's and I see the wider team as being primary care, secondary care, tertiary services, um, allied healthcare professionals. We are equal, 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 and valued members of that team. Um, and just making sure that you know, as part of the team, uh, you know, we're as um, as strong as the weakest link. So making sure that that colleagues actually do take that time that time away. And and if they're not, you know, if they've been working six, seven months and they still don't want to, you need to take a break, you know, and um and, and maybe, you know, I'd never be forceful to anyone. I never do that, but actively suggesting that you haven't had a break, please, 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 we will manage the shop while you're while you're away. Go and get some break. You will come back recovered, uh, feeling much better. And as a consequence, you will perform so much better for for your patients. Thanks, Stella. That's fantastic. Gretchen, may I go to you? Yes, yeah, so I was just making some notes so that I um sound coherent um I, I, I agree with peter i think apologizing to patients is incredibly powerful but i also think we have to be honest with them i think if we know that waiting for their next ent operation or hip operation is going to be two years then we need to say that to them and we need to be honest and say look that's that's what we're looking at and explain to them why so that they understand the process i think we have to be looking at things from a holistic point of view. So if they are going to be on the waiting list for that long, what's their main issue? Is their main issue pain? Are they actually only taking paracetamol? Can we try and you know, maximize what they're doing? Do they need some physio? Do they need some acupuncture? Do they need some complementary medicine or, or something? What, what else might work for them? Do they need some mental health support? Have you got other patients that they could be talking to? We really need to be looking at things probably slightly outside our comfort zone. Um, Peter mentioned the CPOC and actually there was, there was a bit in that that I really like, which is called BRAN, which is where you talk to the patient about the benefits, the risks, the alternatives and doing nothing in regards to the operation. Because actually, if we're looking at, say, from my, my field, you know, a reversal of stoma, do they actually need the reversal of stoma? Uh, is, is life actually pootling on okay for them? Is this an expectation they had before the pandemic? And if they're going to be waiting two years, are they actually, as things now change and actually they're happy to come off the waiting list and sort of review things in three, four years time? I don't know, but it's a discussion to be had with patients. We need to very much make sure we've got shared decision-making with our patients. When it comes to our colleagues, again, we've got to be thinking about doing things together so we've got to think about each other and we've got to support each other yes it would be great to be able to all do an extra Saturday operating list if we're getting paid for it but actually if you're a bit burnt out or you're knackered or you're not really enjoying it or like you say you've got to look after an elderly relative we need to be supporting that is there maybe someone who you think is always doing the extra operating is that fair on them are they happy to because actually they they want the extra money and they just love operating and they love that theatre environment um, or are they doing it because they feel like they have to because because they're the locum consultant and feel like they have to jump through some hoops to be able to get a permanent job. But there are always other things to be thinking about. And from the educational point of view, Stella, um, the JCST brought out an interesting um, document talking about how you as an individual can maximise your education. Simple stuff like making sure you're available for theatre lists, 
when you have got a theatre list really maximising the WBAs that you can do from it, really making sure that you are essentially maximising every learning opportunity available. Now, I think that very much has to be I don't want to say put on, but it has to be accepted by the trainers as well. And there really has to be an emphasis on using the hashtag, no, no training today, no surgeons tomorrow. And I think that's something that, that probably could do with a bit of a cultural shift. Um, we all know that there are certain uh, trainers who maybe don't train as much as others. And I think that's something that we really need to be pushing for both as trainees um, and, and as trainers is making sure that we are maximizing everything that we can do i think there needs to be a systemic give as well i think there has to be an acceptance that there is only so much that you as an individual can do to maximize your training and i think someone had mentioned either in one of the pre uh, questions but will the covid experience that we've had be taken into account at arcps i think it has to be because we've learned a whole host of other transferable communication, teamwork, and human factor skills that can only in the long term make us better. And if realistically we're looking at COVID being part of our life, if it's never really going to go away, then we need to be making sure that we've got consultants in the future that know how to deal with COVID, be that educationally or being redeployed to ITU. Do we actually need to be thinking systemically about how do we include this in our educational process? Because we don't want to lose these skills. So and is, is there something around having ARCPs actually have a, uh, having a, a COVID skill box test or a pandemic box that we need to be thinking about as well? So I won't try and completely change how we educate trainees just yet, but uh, give me some time. <laughs> Lovely, Greta, thank you very, very much uh, for that. So if I can summarise where I think we are today, we know that the NHS has had a enormous hit with COVID and actually it has a, had a, a mental and physical impact on, to be honest, each and every one of us, but just in different ways. I think we need to recognise that people have been affected in different ways and recognise that they are the same people that are going to be delivering the work that needs to be done and my ask is September onwards. I think there is absolutely a conversation that there needs to be an elective pause in some way where we let people take their holidays, rest, recuperate, restore, ready for the next phase, which is going to be difficult because we've got winter pressures and COVID and other things. The New Deal for Surgery specifies many of the factors that are needed to, to do what we need to do. But for me, the most important one of that is to value and respect, retain our resource. And that's what a lot of the questions in the, in the chat has come from. The patients cannot be forgotten in what we do and the patients are central to everything we do. And how do we encourage, embrace, envelope those patients in care, even if they're sitting on a waiting list? So I have to say thank you to Greta and Peter. You've been absolutely fabulous. So thank you very much for this. Um, I'm, next week's episode is discussing the easing of restrictions and ventilation. Uh, so Humphrey put in the group, he's sitting at home um, doing virtual clinics instead of being there. I'm hoping by next week there'll be a very different conversation about the restrictions that, that we are facing. Uh, that features uh, Professor Kath Noakes and G uh, Gabriel Scally. Um, just to make sure I emphasize there are a couple of Royal College of Surgeons events which I, I'm personally really, really excited about. Women in surgery, which of course is not going to be needed in the next 30 years, is however now 30 years old. Um, and there is an event at the Royal College of Surgeons of England on the 10th of September. Uh, this will also be a hybrid uh, online as well as face to face. Future of Surgery, which is 9th and 10th of November, which Greta into which plays your conversation about what is a surgeon and how holistic are we, including COVID. And all I need to say now is thank you so much for all the questions that have come in. Um, mm. uh, it's been a, a great session. I've really enjoyed it. I hope uh, my colleagues have as well. And I will say goodbye to all. Take care, everyone. Keep yeah, well, look after much. each other. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks very Take much. Bye-bye. Well, Take care. keep safe. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.